Okay, it's uh, it's uh, after seven now, so I'm going to get started. And uh, students usually trickle in um, about now and start uh, coming online. Uh, I see people coming in now. Well, I have uh, a, uh, I want to do an Excel spreadsheet this morning, or for me it's this morning, for you um, it's a uh, late afternoon. Um, I'm going to go through a sheet uh, that um, I'm going to emphasize some concepts we've already discussed and introduce some new ones, and uh, we'll see how that goes. I hope it doesn't take too long. Um, I'm still trying to uh, wait for my coffee to kick in this morning. Um, now let's uh, let me go uh, turn on um, recording. Okay, it's, it's on. Is it? Let me try. Okay, I'm going to stop recording and then turn it back on here. I think I'm not sure how this is working. Okay, I guess recording's working. Okay, so um, let me go to full screen here and get started with the uh, for the lesson for this class. I hope everyone is uh, doing well. Um, and uh, I'm still trying to get used to all this virus stuff. I don't know if I mentioned to you that I uh, signed up for a vaccine trial and uh, they've uh, called me about it and and um, said they were going to call back and then ask me a bunch of questions. So they uh, I'm waiting for them to call me back. Uh, and um, I, so I guess they're going to ask me uh, about myself and what I do and we'll see about that uh, if they still want me to be in a vaccine trial. I figured getting in the vaccine trial is a way to get the vaccine early. And uh, so that was my motivation. Uh, but of course, since the vaccine isn't completely tested, <clears throat> uh, it might like turn me into the Incredible Hulk or something. So I'm not sure about that, but I mean, let me turn on uh, my uh, record my screen here. OK, here we go. Screen one. OK, I hope you can all see my screen now. And I've got a blank spreadsheet up. There's a spreadsheet that I, I did uh, for me. It was yesterday I did here and uh, to check out some ideas. And uh, so let me try to sort of do that spreadsheet. OK, what I want to do here is something that sounds um, pretty straightforward, I think. I want to set up in an Excel spreadsheet a multiplication times table. So um, let me do that here. Let me extend this size a little bit. OK, uh, right here in this um, uh, cell, I'm going to put two and I'll put three. And I'm going to select both cells here and now I'm going to drag across. And go up to 12. I'm going to do the same thing down in column A, two, three. Select and then drag down here, so. I'm going to do a, a 12 times table. And um, OK, so what I want to fill in here in these cells, so for example, 2 times 2 will go into this cell, 2 times 3 goes into this cell, and so on. So let me fill this in. OK, uh, right here I'm going to put equals. And now I'm going to click here, let's say 2, times and then 
this will be B1 for the other two. So here's my two times two, A2 times B1, and I hit return. Okay, now, so I have four. Uh, so far, so good. Now, suppose that I decide, okay, I'm going to drag this down. Let me just drag it down one there. And I get 12. And three times two isn't 12. So what's going wrong here? Well, let's look at the formula in this cell. It's A2 here, right here. Sorry, A3 times B2. Well, A3 is this number. That's right. Uh, but B2 is four. So three times four is 12. I don't want B2. <clears throat> I want B1 and not and not B2. So previously I talked a little bit. If we if we don't want the the cell reference, which here references from this cell is B1, this cell is B2. I don't want it to go B1, B2, B3, and so on. I want it to stay B2. So I can fix that by putting a dollar sign in front of the one here, like that. Now when I drag down, it should stay B1. So let me try this. Oh, okay, three times two is six. A3 times B1, that looks like it's working. Let me drag this down. And I have 12 times two is 24. Great, I've got that one working. Now let's look at two times three. So let me, let me click up here on two times two and drag this across. And I get two times three is two. I get 12 again, like the same thing I got before down here at three times two. So what's going wrong here? Let me click on this. I have B2, which is right, B2. I want to multiply here. I want to multiply by B2 times C1. And I have, I click on here, I have, I'm sorry, B2 isn't right. I want, I want B, I want A2, not B2, A2 times C1. And I have B2 times C1. Okay. A similar mistake, except here the error is, is right here. I don't want B2, I want B1. Let me go back to this reference where I have A2 times B1. Let me put now, um, okay, let's see here. So I want A2 times B2, and here I want A2 times, uh, I'm sorry, A2 times B1, and I want A2 times C1. And, and I'm getting here B2 instead of A2. The C1 is still C1. So let me come back here now and let me put a dollar sign in front of the A. That should keep the reference at an A as I drag across. Let's see. So this is six, which is correct. And now I have A2 times C1, A2 times C1. Okay, that's right. So now, how do I fill in the rest of this table? Well, let's try this. Let me select this whole thing right here. Now, let me just drag this whole thing over like that. And, you know, uh, here, I'm not sure this is right. Look at this, I've got three times two is six. And three times three should be nine, and I'm getting 18. So what's going wrong here? It's because when I changed, put the dollar sign in front of the A here, I didn't drag this down. So let me try this. After I put that dollar sign in front of the A, let me drag this down. And um, let me just check one of these cells down here. I have a dollar sign in front of the A. So, okay, now let's try selecting this whole thing and dragging over. Now, 12 times three is 36. Okay, this looks right. 
So you see that um, using those dollar signs and getting them right uh, is an easy place to make mistakes. And uh, so let me again tell you that it's really important that when you're putting in these cell references and then you're dragging things around, go back and check and make sure the cell references are what you want them to be. Okay, now with this, let me just finish dragging this across and see how that looks. I'm going to drag this all the way over to there. And uh, the last one is 12 times 12 should be 144. And so I'm suspecting, let's look at this, 5 times 6 is 30. These are all looking correct. So there's our multiplication times table in Excel. And get it working right, we have to make correct use of the dollar sign uh, notation in the cell references. OK, now something else I want to do here, and I want to cover a bit the concept of um, of doing. Let me come back here. I want to look at conditional formatting. So before I go into that, let me show you the example that I've done previously uh, to give you some idea of what I'm going to be trying to do here. So here we go. This is the one I did yesterday. Now, conditional formatting, notice I've got some different colors here on different cells. And sometimes you might want to do that. For example, if you're looking at a list of people, and let's say you want to know who are all the people on this list who are in Tajikistan. Um, and uh, so you might have a list of people, a list of countries where they're located, and you want to know all the ones located in Tajikistan because of differences in the internet or something like that. And how can you have Excel automatically find those people from the data that's set up within the cell? And then I want to highlight those cells. Now here, for example, on the green cells, I've highlighted all cells that are on the diagonal down here. Two times two is four, that's on the diagonal. Three times three is nine. Four times four is 16. So all of the cells were the row and column reference are the same. It's, in other words, this is four down, and this is four over, for example, or, or five down and five over, because E is the fifth letter in the alphabet. So suppose I want to make all these cells green. All the cells that equal 60, I make yellow, and then I don't remember what I did down here. Maybe all the cells greater in value than 100, I set to be red. So how that's called conditional formatting, because what we use as the format for the cell depends on the value that appears inside the cell. And that can be really useful for highlighting certain characteristics of a set of data. And uh, so this is what conditional formatting is used for. So before I go back to the spreadsheet I'm working on, let me just look a little bit here. Conditional formatting and um, I click on that and I get this as my drop down menu. And in particular, I want to look at manage rules to show you uh, how I set up the rules that determine the colors here that are appearing in the cell. So manage rules <clears throat> and nothing's coming up. And that's because what I didn't do is I didn't select the cells where I want to see what the rules are. So I can select here. I can select all the cells going down here like that. So I select all these cells. Now I go to conditional formatting and I say manage rules. And I get these are the three rules for the green, the red and the yellow uh, on the cell. So let uh, these are the rules. 
this is the format that's being applied to the cell. And and then this tells you which cells the rules apply to. And this says sheet one, and it's going from B2, uh, L, I'm reading this, this is L18, B, B2, which is here, all the way down to here, which is L18. Okay, so this is why it applies to it. And sheet one, sorry. And this is referencing the sheets. And I don't know if I mentioned this to you down here. We can, within the same Excel file, in the same Excel workbook, we can add more sheets by clicking here. So this is sheet one. We can add another completely blank sheet here by clicking on the plus sign, which I, I'm not going to do right now. So these are the rules. So look, let's look at these rules. I, I have cell value equal to row times row. That sets the green. So row, open close parentheses, is a function that fills in the row number. So on this cell right here, the row number is six. So for this cell, I'm checking if the cell value equals six times six, 36, then I'm setting it to green. And that's exactly what I have here, six times six. Now this rule applies to all of the cells here in the multiplication times table. Here, row is seven, seven times seven is 49, but the value of the cell is 35. So this doesn't satisfy the rule. So it's not being turned green. So the format of the cell is conditioned on what this rule is and the value that appears within the cell. Let's look at red. Red here is say if the cell value is greater than 100, and that's what I speculated a moment ago, then I set the cell value to red. And that's what's happening here. Every place where the cell value is 100, it's red, except notice that the green stays on, which is what we had up here. Now, I'm, um, you know, I, I'll, I mean, I'm going to confess here, I'm a little bit confused about the rules used to apply the cells because this rule is set first and this rule is set second following that. Now, normally when we program computers, what we do second is actually what, what rules. And this is done first, but this stays green going down here. This is done second. So it doesn't change it red, it stays green. So that's what seems to be happening here. So you might want to keep this in mind. But we apply the rules in order. It says change rule order. So I'm assuming this is applied first, this is applied second, and it looks like it does not overrule what we do first, and then this is applied third. Now we can choose not to apply the rule if the rule applies. So for example, if this applies in a cell, if a cell is turned green, if I clicked here, I would expect it to stay green and not turn red, but that's, it's nothing changes it because it stayed green anyway. So we can stop the other rules from applying if the earlier rule is applied by checking these boxes. The other thing we can do is change the order of the rules. So for example, I can take this rule and by clicking the down arrow, I'll move it down to here. So this rule is applied first, this rule is applied second, this rule is applied third. Now, uh, let me see what happens if I click OK. So notice all the greens turn to red. So how these rules are applied is, a, is different than I would have expected them to be applied. I don't know what you would expect, but again, um, let me emphasize, I've said before, the importance of doing experiments. When you open up a new piece of software and you want to figure out 
if I change this, what happens? So you do it. You set it up and you change it. You see what happens. I, I've done that all the time in all kinds of computer programming. And Excel is a kind of computer programming. So you should do it again here. So let me come back. Condi uh, conditional formatting here. And uh, okay, now, I don't know. right here, conditional formatting, manage rules. And then I could click on this. I could put it back up in first place so I can change the order in which the rules apply. Now, let me go back to this right here. And um, OK, so I want to apply some rules. So I'll click on all the cells where I want the rules to apply. So I select and then shift click down here and I select all these cells. Now I go to conditional formatting and I type and I don't type, I select here new rule. Now I have choices here, but these are none of the choices that I actually want. This is saying two color scale, lowest value, highest value. You have to do some experiments here to figure out what that means. I want to go to classic. It's because I'm old and everything about me is classic. Uh, I want to go to classic, format only top to bottom ranked values. That's not what I want to do. I want to go use formula to determine which cells to format. That's what I want here. Or no, maybe not. I want to format only cells that contain. This is what I want. So it's and and now what this is and what this is, you might want to experiment with those two to see exactly uh, how they differ. I'm going to do this format only cells that contain. I don't want to do specific text. I want to do cell value. And this is saying for cell values between two two values. And I what I, if I do before what I want to do is set if the cell is equal to. And now I want to put in my formula row times row. Well, let's try that. I want to put equal here, equal. Now I want to put in the row function, row, open close, times row, open close. So I hope I did that right. Let's try OK. And indeed, all these cells where the cell value equals the row squared. So here row is 8. 8 times 8 is 64. I get 64. So that is how I impose uh, the rules for doing conditional formatting. Now, if you go back up here and you look, uh, at what you can do in conditional formatting, I could add another rule to this whole group. I could do new rule again. And then I could say, go back, I want to do classic. Uh, I want to do format cells that contain. And I want to do cell value again, cell value. And I want to do not between and not equal to, but greater than. And now I'll type in equals 100. And let's see what happens there. And now I've set all these to red, but then how does that differentiate from these being red? And uh, perhaps I didn't want to do that. Uh, manage rules. I go to here. And you see, I, I don't want these to be red, so I have to edit the rule. And format with light red, dark red. OK, let me do, uh, let me try yellow there. Now hit OK. Now it looks like it's going to change to yellow. And this is down the diagonal here, I get yellow. Now, is that what I wanted? That's how did I set up the conditional formatting, manage rule, and now I'm saying cell value equals row times row, and that's what I did. So 
I, rather than changing the cell value greater than 100, I change the cell value here. Now notice, by the way, that this rule is applied to the cells. And then even though some of the cells satisfy this rule, it doesn't change them to yellow, it keeps them red. So our little experiment here indicates that this rule gets applied first and it stays applied. OK, and so even if this rule also applies to the cell, it's not applied over top of, it doesn't supersede that top rule. OK, so that is, um, let me cancel here. So that is my idea here with uh, doing uh, how you use conditional formatting. And this is a simple example, uh, but I hope it sort of makes what's going on a little bit more clear. Uh, I mean, I'll confess here, I have always found Microsoft software uh, to be a bit confusing. And um, I, uh, I've always thought that when they design their software and set up the rules, that they're just not as clear about what they're doing as other companies. Uh, in particular, when I say other companies, I mean Apple. I've always found Apple to be largely intuitive in that you kind of don't need to know how something works. You can just jump in and start using it, and uh, it usually you can figure it out pretty quickly. That's because they spend a huge amount of time uh, trying to make their software that way. And um, Microsoft um, obviously doesn't spend that time. I've also found Google uh, to be confusing uh, when I uh, try to go in and I try to see how to change settings on Google applications. I have, I have in fact, I would say that I found uh, Google ways of, manip of using their software is often very confusing and not well explained. So I think Google might be even worse than Microsoft. OK, now, OK, so that's conditional formatting and how to use the, uh, the dollar sign notation in setting up the cell rules. Uh, and, and I think this is a good example for how you might want to use this. Well, notice that when I put the dollar sign in front of the A, the four will still increment here. So as I go to here, it still changes the five. It's only the A that doesn't change as I go across. So it keeps referencing column A even as I go across. And then as I go down on the cell here, it keeps referencing C1. Now it doesn't change C, because I'm remaining in column C. It doesn't change the row if I stay in that row. So I can put the dollar sign in front of the A telling A not to change, but it, the row can change if I'm sliding down rows. And, I mean, sliding the row, the column can, yeah, the row can change as I slide down rows because I don't have a dollar sign in front of the row. So the dollar sign applies to the A and not to the seven. Here, the dollar sign applies to the one and not to the C. So that is the, the special property in using the dollar sign notation that you need to remember. Uh, let me go back to the, to the uh, syllabus just for a moment here. Syllabus, here it is. OK. Now, we're already in week three. Uh, my guess is you're you're beginning to feel the exhaustion of the semester by now. Um, week one, there was a bit of excitement about starting a new semester and finding out what your courses were about. Week two, you're kind of beginning to settle in, and now it's beginning to seem like a lot of work. Um, and I'm going to give you a heads up on some of these videos, because when I looked back on the videos, um, I've decided that these solver videos, you might have to look at more than once. Um, 
uh, and to uh, understand exactly what they're talking about. I apologize for that. Um, you know, solver, um, I, you may not actually even have solver on your version of Excel. So if you don't have solver and you can't download it and add it, your solver has to be added to the um, to Excel. It's called an add-in. Okay, so add-in means it has to be added. So if IT hasn't added solver in, you're going to have to add it in. And you, to figure out how to add it in, I've mentioned these kinds of things before, but it's worth reminding you that um, you can Google add, add solver, okay? How to, I, I'll type Excel, then I'll say add, add in. So I'm saying add in twice here just to emphasize that's what I want. Probably don't need to do that. I could say Excel add in something like that. Uh, return Excel add ins, words most popular add ins. So he, I, there's a add or remove add ins in Excel office support. This is probably what you're looking for. And I see uh, because it, it's been highlighted here. That's what I looked at. You can also go into YouTube and search. So let me just copy that search and now go into YouTube. YouTube. Oh, I don't know what was going on there. Excel added. OK, now let me hit return. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Let me just type add in Excel. Add ins there. Dashboard tools for Excel, best Excel add ins. I know it's getting wait. OK. Here are the here are the YouTube six free add ins for Excel to start using now. One of them might be solver top 10 Excel add ins. How to install an Excel add in. This might be a good thing to look at. And as I've told you before, I find uh, here. Let me get out. I don't want it to play. As I've told you before, I usually find going to YouTube videos to be much more helpful than looking at a set of instructions on a web page because when you go to the YouTube video, they actually show you what to click and what steps to do. You follow the instructions. Sometimes they'll say, go to um, was up. Go to the was up on, on the homes menu and you go to the homes menu and you don't find was up. OK, so this is what the problem I have with reading a text on how to do something, because frequently what they describe isn't what you have. And this is a particular problem I found with, again with Microsoft software, because it's probably not so true now, but there was a, while, a time when every time Microsoft came out with a new version of Excel, they moved where things appeared on the uh, on the ribbon. So, for example, they may have had an item on the home selection of the ribbon in one application of Excel, and then in a later application, they changed it to data. So you're you're reading a set of instructions that apply to the first application, but you're using the, the remake of the application, and what you're looking for is in data, and they're telling you to look in home. This is a, a continuous problem I've had with Microsoft, and, um, and in particular, it's a problem I've had with Excel, in that I Google how to do something to figure out how to do something in Excel, and the set of instructions I get just don't seem to apply. And what also makes it worse, as I've mentioned to you, I use a Mac. And sometimes the application for the Mac is different than the application 
for a PC running Windows, which is an extra complication. So I have a long list of grievances uh, against Microsoft, but you know, applications like Excel, PowerPoint, and Word are so ubiquitous, and everyone uses them that uh, you know you have to overcome these issues. Now, before I finish here with the lecture, let me just add one other thing: that you start looking for a job, and you fit, make up your resume. Uh, you can put on your resume, and people do it, that you know how to use Excel. I mean, we've only had, what we're only going to have, what, six weeks of using Excel. But believe me, you will know a lot more about using Excel after these six weeks than other people who have just used it to make tables and charts and whatever. I would... You'd be surprised. Most people don't know how to put things in alphabetical order, for instance. And I can promise you, most people don't know conditional formatting and things like that. So when you're applying for a job, put on your resume, you know, on your skills, if you have a section on what you know how to do, put on your resume that you know how to use Excel. Okay. Uh, that's all I want to do for today. Uh, and... Uh, the lecture is only a little bit, a little bit more than a half an hour, rather than uh, what my typical lecture is for an hour, um, and um, which is makes life easy for me. Uh, let me see if you have any questions. Let me come back here and go back in to see all your uh, pretty faces here. And um, okay, so. Anybody have any additional questions uh, about my lecture today or about anything else? Are your other courses going well? Okay. Yes. Okay, good. They're, they're okay. Okay, okay is... Um, not great. See, if they're really going well, people say, oh, my <laughs> courses are great. And, um, um, you know, uh, I hope you guys aren't uh, uh, insulted or offended, but when I was in Central Asia, I referred to Central Asia collectively, like all the countries there, you know, Kyrgyzstan, Tajik, Kazakhstan, and so on. I I referred to those countries as the land of funny hats because every, you know, every country, every culture, every ethnic group sort of had a, a different traditional hat. Um, and like uh, uh, and, and, uh, in America, uh, maybe our funny hat is the cowboy hat. I, I don't know. Uh, we got lots of funny hats here. And... Um, but I always refer to the land of uh, to Central Asia as the land of funny hats because you could almost look at a person if they were wearing a hat and figure out where they were from, which is probably the intention of uh, of having a special hat. Um, so uh, that's just one stupid comment that I thought I would make. Yeah, we're here in the States. Uh, we're coming down to the... Uh, uh, coming up to the election, it's only in about in six weeks, and uh, you know things are really intense. In my lifetime, I've never seen things so intense over an election, and um, and they're really intense. And to make things even more complicated, uh, one of the important judges on the on our Supreme Court in the United States died. It may have been on the news there, maybe not. Uh, the judge was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And um, before she became a Supreme Court judge, she was um, she was a civil rights lawyer. 
and she uh, really um, was a strong uh, advocate for women's rights. And I think in most countries around the world, and it was certainly and is certainly true to some extent still in the United States, um, women are um, second class to men in, in that most countries, uh, men are given uh, preference over women. And uh, I know in the Soviet days, they really, the official line of the Soviets was that everyone was equal. And I think the Soviets you know, did a pretty fair job of trying to put women on an equal footing. They did better than the United States did, I think. But United States Ruth Bader Ginsburg was made really huge changes in women's rights in the United States. So she has been very popular. And like most of our famous judges in the United States, what she was famous for was when she disagreed with the ruling of the court. In the United States, there are nine judges on the Supreme Court. And, and when the nine judges hear a case, then they vote on what they, they, the court has a ruling and the judges will vote on whether to support the ruling or not. And if a mo majority of judges support the ruling, then the ruling becomes the law. And um, like many of the very famous court judges in the United States, the most famous ones are typically the judges who dissent, who disagree with a ruling, and then they write a strong and articulate and well-reasoned dissent. So that the court makes a ruling, and then there, there is the statement of the ruling, and anyone who disagrees with the ruling can write a dissent, and they can explain why they think the ruling is wrong. And, and Ginsburg, like many judges in, in history at the United States, is famous for her strong and articulate disagreements. And uh, she, has be she had become, over her lifetime, she was well into her 80s when she died a few days ago. Uh, she, had be she had become famous over her time on the court. I think it was about 25 years she was on the Supreme Court because judges get appointed to the court for life in the United States. She was famous for her articulate and strong uh, uh, dissents. Now, when she graduated from law school in the United States, so first of all, she went to uh, a university called Cornell University as an undergraduate. And Cornell is one of the Ivy League schools like Harvard, Princeton, Yale. Cornell is one of those. There are eight Ivy League schools. And, uh, you know, typically people refer to the Ivy League schools as being really great schools, and they are. But oddly, the Ivy League isn't uh, meant, was never meant to represent schools of status. It was an athletic league. So all the schools in the Ivy League many, many, many years ago, more than 100 years ago, all agreed, I think, that they were going to have their football teams all play one another. So the Ivy League is a sports league and not a, a, a mention of academic um, excellence. Although, because the Ivy League schools tend to be very old and older schools tend, tend to, in the United States, tend to have a uh, stronger reputation simply because they're older, um, so people tend to think the Ivy League is a measure of academic excellence, and technically it's not. So she graduated from Cornell as an undergraduate, and uh, I believe she was first in her class at Cornell as a woman. And then she went to, I think it's Columbia Law School. Columbia is another Ivy League school. Um, and she graduated first in her law school class. And back when she graduated, there weren't 
very many women lawyers in the United States. Something like 2% of all lawyers were women. And even though she graduated first in her class in law school, she had a hard time getting a job as a lawyer. And uh, because there was a natural tendency uh, with the law firms that were mostly men to believe that that women just couldn't be good lawyers. And uh, so she uh, she has done many things to help uh, raise the uh, status of women in the United States. And even though that status, um, women, I would say, are not yet fully uh, equal in status in the United States, they're, it's very close now. And uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has had a tremendous effect on that. And, and she has become uh, a hero for, uh, for women in the United States. So I thought I would just mention that because it's one of the things now which is affecting the election because there's a big debate now on who gets to appoint the next Supreme Court judge, because usually what happens is the president makes a recommendation of who he wants to be the judge. So Trump uh, would make a recommendation. And then the United States Senate, which is half of the Congress, so it's half of our legislative body. The Senate then is forced to either approve or not approve that selection. So, and the big debate now is should Trump select the next justice, or since the election is so close, should that selection be put off for the next person elected president? That could still be Trump, because in the United States, presidents can be elected for two terms. Um, so it could be Trump again, and I, I hope not, uh, or it could be Biden who is the other candidate for president. I guess if uh, if we were like Russia, Biden would have been poisoned by now. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm sorry. I apologize to anyone who's a big Soviet Russia supporter. Um, so I thought I'd give you a little uh, history of current events, what's happening in the United States, because it's the only current events I know uh, pretty much. Okay, let me ask again, does anybody have any uh, any more questions before I end the lecture? No questions so far. Okay, yeah, I'm looking down the list here. Okay, okay so, uh, so good for that. And um, I, um, I hope that, um, I hope you don't have too many problems with those homeworks. Like I said, the the videos uh, that once the last two videos, you might have to look at them more than once. I hope it's not too confusing. And uh, so um, I'll see you on Thursday. Stop recording. And.